The views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hello and welcome to Real Reviews. My name is Jameson Rabbit and this week I've got a guest. Yeah, how exciting. And I am so excited to reintroduce you to our old friend. It is Michael Seleski. Welcome back, sir. Glad to be back. Always a good time to be sitting next to you talking movies. It's always yeah. a good time. When it's a thousand degrees out, it's nice to go yeah, sit in an air-conditioned theater. Yeah, it's it's definitely a better way to spend the time than being out in the sun. So yeah, nice yeah. cold, dark room. Snuggle up with some popcorn. Should have assigned you some drive-in movies to go watch. Ooh, that would have been fun. <laughs> we, got, we got a drive-in theater out by where I'm yeah, at. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a good one. Uh, we have a bunch of movies to talk about here this week, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started with what we have on the marquee. And the first one I'm going to go with is a film called Strays from director Josh Greenbaum. Uh, it is uh, well, it's about a bunch of dogs. One of them is voiced by Will Ferrell. His name is Reggie. Reggie is a naive dog. Uh, voiced by Will Ferrell. Feels like Will Ferrell kind of channeling uh, Buddy the Elf energy. Yep. Uh, he's the dog who's loyal to his awful owner, Doug, played by Will Forte, who's just the worst guy in the world. Uh, Doug continually tries to get rid of Reggie until one day he actually achieves it and ditches him in an alley in the big city. Uh, and Reggie finds himself lost in this alley and is taken in by some fellow strays, one of them led by Bug, a brash little Boston Terrier voiced by Jamie Foxx, who gives this Rube Reggie the lowdown on how to survive on the streets. Uh, they are soon joined by a Great Dane therapy dog with a cone around his neck, voiced by Randall Park, and an Australian shepherd, Maggie, who is voiced by Isla Fisher. Uh, they try to help Reggie realize, you know what, you're better without Doug, and to embrace being a stray. And, and Reggie decides that he needs to return to Doug to get his payback on him. Uh, and his payback is, well, he wants to bite Doug in the pleasure zone. Uh, and what happens along the way is this road trip movie. And uh, it's a hard R adventure movie mm -hmm. featuring lots of aggressive sexual situations, cursing dogs, uh, a lot of scatological humor. Yep. Um, and we get a, you know, we, you just saw in the trailer here, the mandatory tripping on mushroom sequence. Um, there's also what I thought was a pretty hilarious cameo from the, the recent king of dog movies, Dennis Quaid, who has been in like five movies about dead dogs. Um, we thought that was kind of funny that he's playing Dennis Quaid in this. And, uh, I mean, it, the story is thin. The jokes are, uh, I think... It, your mileage will vary on how you feel about the uh, the level of humor of this movie, but I actually really liked. Uh, at one time, Bug is giving his backstory, and I found myself kind of liking that backstory, kind of caring about the issues that led these strays to being who they are. Um, and like I said, your I think your mileage will vary on this movie and what you go into it expecting, but I actually found myself laughing out loud at a lot of points in this film. Yeah, against my better judgment, there were a few laugh out loud uh, moments for me as well. Um, like I said, I, th I think the, the story is pretty thin on the ground. Yeah. I think it's a one note joke that says, hey, you remember Homeward Bound? Remember how good and wholesome that was? <laughs> what if they did this? Uh, what, 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 if it was, what if it wasn't quite so wholesome? And yeah. this isn't quite so wholesome. Um, there are some jokes that they, they kind of beat into the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, to me, it treads on ground very similar to like Sausage Party. Yeah. Where it's it's lewd for the sake of its lewdness, and I, I watched it with uh, an older couple, and they seemed to enjoy it. Um, I I didn't think it was tremendously strong, mm -hmm. but there were parts of it that were very redeeming. As as a dog owner myself, yeah, Bug's backstory hit, hit you kind of right yeah. in the feels to the point where I I actually felt like oh my lord I am I am experiencing emotion at the Strays movie for, yeah. for a half a minute. Was not expecting this. Uh, wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting the uh, the bit with the lost kid mm -hmm. uh, to, to, yeah. to come through halfway through that movie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just the, the, the careless way that uh, Will Forte treats his dog <laughs> makes you really feel bad yeah. a, a, as a dog owner. It made it's, it's me... Tough. We saw it, and my son and I immediately were like, we need to get home and see Pal, our dog. Yeah, like, I can't wait to go see him. We're going to go spoil this guy, tell him what a good boy he shout, is. Shout out to my Basset Hound Linus. <laughs> yeah. Good boy. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, 
I laughed enough to say that, oh, I, I can't say I didn't enjoy it. The shock, there's the shock factor, like you mentioned. I think that wears off kind of quick. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of really absurd bits in here. I mean, there's a moment where they're trying to, they're trying to get uh, some keys off a wall. That yeah. That was a joke I was expecting. I actually liked the, uh, the, the, the Josh Cat Gad yeah. uh, voiceover for the dog, the, the narrating yeah, dog who yeah. doesn't respond to anything, just kind of <laughs> narrates into the middle distance. I, I got mileage out of that joke yeah. twice. I mean, I don't know if I would rewatch this movie. No. I don't know if it has rewatchability, but for 90 minutes, it passed. It was fun. I laughed out loud. It, it, and like I said, it got me going home telling my dog Paladin. Honestly, you're I, such I, a good boy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's kind of like the the pass fail of these movies. Is I, I when I'm walking out of the theater, I generally ask myself, is there a, a time in which I could conceive of watching this movie again? And I yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, it think doesn't I have the legs it. for that. No, there's <laughs> so many legs in the movie. I know. Each one's got four of them. <laughs> Most, uh, yeah, I think they all. So, do. but no, there's the. It's it's not as strong as it could be, and I, I I think this would have worked better as a short or an SNL skit. Yeah, it it seems like it has about that much content. Yeah, that's that's that how seems I thought. Fair. Uh, what did you end up giving Strays, sir? Middle of the road, two and a half. Yeah, right down the center. Yeah, I gave it slightly more. I gave it three. It got me laughing here and there, but yeah, it's it was entertaining enough and bl blissfully short, which I like. Yeah, I no. feel like some of these movies we've I've gotten lately are if that long for the sake of being long. If that would have stretched into two hours, oh, it, yeah, yeah, my would score be. would have dropped precipitously. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's move on to what we have this week uh, for our superhero movie of the week. What yeah, do you have for us? It's it's becoming a weekly feature. The yeah. the, the the studios keep producing uh, superhero movies, and the Blue Beetle is the latest film produced by the folks at DC Comics. And I don't know if it's superhero fatigue or what, but it feels like I've seen this movie before, or at least the amalgamation of the movie can made up by its constituent parts. It's part Ant-Man, it's part Spider-Man, it's part Iron Man, it's part Watchmen. Blue Beetle tells the story of Jaime Reyes, played by Jolo Maradueña, a recent college grad who comes home to find his immigrant family living through some tough times. Lucky for him, he's got an in with Jenny Cord, played by Bruna Marquezine, and she's the daughter of one of the founders of Cord Industries, a large conglomerate with its fingers in a whole lot of industries, one of which being weapons manufacturing. By coincidence, Jaime gets paired with a symbiote that allows him to turn into the titular Blue Beetle, which is a technology that Susan Sarandon, who's in this movie for some reason, would really like to get her hands on, thank you very much. The redeeming strength of the Reyes family is what distinguishes this movie. George Lopez is having a blast yeah. as the fun conspiracy uncle. Mm -hmm. And the grandma character is my personal favorite. Viva la revolucion, Nina. <laughs> Viva la revolucion. Yeah. The cinematic universe, this particular cinematic universe, is on death row. It's not really a fitting place for Blue Be Beetle. It's unclear whether any of this character is going to make it into the soon-to-be-launched James Gunn version of the DC universe. And I don't think the returns on this particular movie is going to do yeah. much to, to, to assure it a place. It's, it's, it certainly isn't a bad film. I think it suffers from comparison to similar titles, the, the stuff that it takes from it. Mm -hmm. um, and this would have been a mind-blowing movie, I think, 10 years ago. But I think it really suffers from the, the, the tone set by, by Ant-Man, by Iron Man. And I, th I think that box office fatigue is really starting to show up. In, in, in tent poles like this. I don't think it did very well. Yeah. What What did you think? Of yeah, that? I mean, I think you're right, is that we've seen diminishing returns, even with Marvel. Like, DC has been a rocky road in the yes. entirety of it. And, you know, coming off of Black Adam, which was a notorious bomb, The Flash, which I enjoyed, but it was also a struggle to the box office, and then Marvel properties have been struggling mightily. I think everyone's just kind of getting a little tired of it. I enjoyed a lot of this movie. I, you know, it's groundbreaking because it's it's entirely Hispanic American cast. Yeah, I, I think that's really really great. And this is a it's a vintage superhero Blue Beetle, and we, they put this modern twist on him. Um, and I, I I like that. A lot of this did feel like things I'd seen before. Um, I, I like. The guy who plays Jaime Reyes, he was Miguel in Cobra Kai. Yep. I, I like him a lot. And like you said, the family dynamic is great. Yeah. I love the family dynamic in here. As the movie progresses, they become more and more important to this movie. Yeah, unlike uh, so many of these superhero families where they're just sort of like the background characters yeah. that might provide some no, of the No, they're like, the strength the of this. They are the absolute strength of yeah. this. And they drive the plot forward through the middle of this movie. I mean, we get... 
your typical stuff. I mean, this is going back to the '70s. The greatest American hero. You get a suit, and then you have to have the whole. Yeah. Oh, what are my powers? How do they work? You know, we have to have a whole sequence. This has got that sequence. But I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I think you got to be pretty lost in the sauce to to know like the the backstory of the Blue Beetle. And I'm certainly not lost in the sauce. So when we're discussing the symbiote, like there's almost no backstory given to it. Well, there's very little backstory I think, given to it. <laughs> unfortunately, I think a lot of it they rely on like, hey, you guys, have you seen? Venom, it's kind of similar. It's similar to that, and our character is kind of similar to that, where you have a hero with the symbiote that's like, all right, let's kill that guy, and he's like, no, we don't kill. Yeah, stop. And it almost felt like I'm watching Terminator 2, and Edward Furlong is telling the Terminator, we don't kill people. All right, it's, like, some of, keep reminding you, we don't kill. Some of the action is 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 pretty solid, especially when he he that that last some, act. Those yeah, the last act, the battles are fun with he and Carapax. Yep, I honestly, I like that. Unlike a lot of these DC movies where I think they all kind of fall apart at the end. This one I actually think gets stronger as it goes I on. I think you're right too. Um, my one big issue was I felt like I was struggling with the tone of the movie where at some points it would be like really serious yeah, and then it would get slapsticky. <laughs> you know, Uncle no, Rudy would show up and it would get slapsticky and, yeah, like, and then we're dealing with some the George Lopez stuff. character has, has got like a conspiracy theory bent to him yeah. and as a student of history there is something to be said about uh, the United States' history of imperialism in yeah. Latin America. And yeah. this movie... Oh, it deals heavily it, with it that. It deals heavily <laughs> with it, and it talks about it quite quite a bit. And the, like, the scene in which the, the family deals with the raid on them by court yeah. looks like it could have been strict taken from like Homeland Security, yeah, a, some DEA footage. Raid, a DEA raid. So it's, um, you know, it, it, it certainly... For those who want to read a deeper plot into this, there's certainly enough material I mean, to make it happen. The big issue is the villain is super thin. Okay. I mean, it's the villain and the is Susan paid by Sarandon numbers. Susan is there to chew scenery. Yeah, and uh, she's the, there to be Eve. The charm of the family helps kind of pull that out. But I went to this movie. I wanted it to be good, and I love a lot of the cast. I felt like it got really random at times, but I. I don't know. I felt I felt bad for this movie because it sits amongst the ruins of the DC EU right yeah, now. Yeah, it's and it wants to spin a future. There's a mid credit scene yeah. that I thought was really interesting. That unfortunately, because of the box office returns and where just the DC EU movies are right it's now, probably with this not smoldering mess. Take off. This doesn't have a future, and I'm frustrated by that because I thought this was actually fairly good. I mean, try try to imagine an alternate history or an alternate universe where you've never seen Ant-Man. Right. Where you've never seen Iron Man. Yeah. Back in the days when, when you and I were growing up and superhero movies were a joke. Mm -hmm. If this would have come out even a decade ago, 15 yeah. years ago, you'd have been running to the theater yep. to see this two or three times. Yeah. But, but I think it really suffers from the fact that you've this sort of random, quirky, almost humorous, but still action-packed aesthetic, it, it just doesn't work. In, yeah. in the way that it used to, it's a good, it's a good film. It's not a bad film, and if you look at it against the the, the recent DC universe, I think it's stronger than Flash. Yeah. I know it's stronger than uh, Black Adam. Yeah. You know, I I don't think it's, this. I think it's better than Wonder Woman eighty four. Yes, I, I agree. I think it's a lot better than Wonder Woman. I mean, Woman it's the problem is I feel like okay. So on this show for the last five years, I've been ringing the bell of the superhero bubble and how it's gonna burst. I think and we've got. The whole Hollywood has gone all in on it, right? And I mean, Scorsese, other directors have been saying this too, but ring the bell, like, it's going to burst at some point. And I feel like it's burst and we just haven't realized it, and companies haven't realized it yet. Well, but I, I feel I, like. I, th I think there's still air in the line that has to be let out. There's still movies that were greenlit back right, when the bubble absolutely. was really going that we're going we're gonna to have to get through a little bit before we get to it. I, th I think the next bubble is going to be movies adapted off of games and toys. Yeah. I mean, we're starting to see that this year has been a lot of intellectual properties yep. as movie fair. And, and as a guy who plays Magic the Gathering, there's plenty of content <laughs> yeah. there to be mine. Give me one good Magic the Gathering movie. So, I mean, what did you ultimately end up giving Blue Beetle? Like I say, I, it's it's going to feel like it's, this is a down score, but it's not. I give it three and a half. It's it's a solid movie. It's better than a middle of the road movie. Um, it's it's well worth your time. I just I feel like you say it's it sits among the wreckage of the DC universe. Yeah, yeah. I end up I'm giving it uh, three out of five stars. Okay. Uh, I enjoyed it. You know, yeah. I mean, there there was some unevenness in the tone that kind of irritated me, and a villain who is just 
not even stereotypically know, very evil. stereotypical un, un, unnecessarily evil. um but it's 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 fun and uh, i do recommend it it's got a great message for family if you're looking for a movie if you're looking for a cold place to go watch a movie uh, <laughs> yeah th this is this is going to be worth your time go support a movie yep. uh all right let's turn to our streaming spotlight this week where i go to hulu for a new film called Miguel Wants to Fight, uh, directed by Oz Rodriguez, stars Tyler Dean Flores as the titular Miguel. He is a teen obsessed with Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan, constantly daydreaming about being in one of this, their films, cutting them together. Um, his father runs the neighborhood boxing studio, and he, he lives in a kind of a rough neighborhood where fights happen in the streets from time to time. And he's got his crew of friends that he runs with, but there's one problem with Miguel is that He's never thrown a, a punch in a fight. And despite his friends kind of getting in fights with other kids and this and that, he always finds himself staying on the outside of the fray. Until one day when he decides he's going to get in a fight. And we find out it's kind of partially to hide the fact that he's moving away soon. And it's kind of his distraction technique. But Miguel and his friends devise various plans for him with rules and everything. He he can't throw the first punch. Uh, he can only fight someone who deserves it. And definitely he should stay away from Damien Del De Delgado. Um, but despite his insistence and his optimism, every time when the moments come, he struggles to rise to the moment. And the movie kind of plays out like a, a fighter video game with various levels and cool visuals you see here. And Miguel seems like a genuinely earnest kid, struggling with teen emotions and unsure how to tackle them. And the teenage emotions that spring up and he was bullied about his shoes and an unfortunate incident he had with the Mona Lisa. Um, and there's issues, especially between Miguel and his best friend, David, who wants Miguel to just be true to himself. Stop trying to be a guy who fights people and be who you really are. Yeah. And uh, we find out Miguel's motivations for wanting to fight Adrian and the secrets that he's been holding away from his friend David. and. It, I thought the young cast in this movie was a lot of fun, and I thought that the style of the film stood out. It felt like a C-level Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Yeah, that's especially the, I just rewatched it a couple weeks ago. And, that is definitely the vibes I got from this movie as yeah. well. There was a lot of that, uh, like the video game level type stuff. Yeah, um, the fight choreography. The fight choreography. Yeah, I, I think this movie has improved the more I've sat and thought about it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of good, you know, movie nerd sort of, uh, of callbacks to, to Jackie. Lots of it. Jackie Chan Lots of it. A lot of homages to those A lot films. of homages. And like I say, the young actors, I think, really do a good job with this. Uh, if I ran with a crew that was as uh, obsessed about getting into fights as this crew, yep. I, I don't know how I'd have made it through <laughs> high school. I, I I don't remember getting into a whole lot of fights, but this, this, uh, this group of people seems to be getting into fights left and right as a pastime, and everyone seems okay with it. Yeah, it's just what happens in the neighborhood. Apparently. You just fight people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I found it enjoyable. Um, I like the, like, there's a fight commentary every time he's about to start a fight. There's an off-screen, like, fight commentary. Yeah. I mean, uh, not, not to spoil anything, but I think you can see the eventual twist at the end of this movie as to where he's, or who he's actually going to end yeah. up fighting. sure. Pretty soon after you start realizing that every single round there's, there's something that, stops the fight from actually Well, and that's happening. kind of my frustration with the movie is it becomes really predictable because you know how it's going to turn out. Yeah, and you exactly. know how every fight is going to turn out because there's the same result over and over in rapid succession, basically. Mm -hmm. And it starts to be like, okay, this feels really repetitive. It's got to end one way. It's got to lead to one thing, I felt. You know, and I, I think the movie is trying to be told from Miguel's standpoint. And, and at times... He he his storytelling narrative kind of exerts a a sort of like a world weariness mm -hmm. that you wouldn't have you wouldn't expect from a from a kid in high school. Yeah. Like how is he supposed to know that his father is uh, projecting his paternal desires upon his buddy? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. something that as a high schooler kid I wouldn't have been able to pick up on, but maybe 20 years later you'd be able to realize that hey, you know, he had a special relationship with uh, your your buddy's dad. Yeah. And, yeah. And and that's why you're getting this sort of this misplaced paternal uh, angst. I, I think it's a strong movie. I I can see why this didn't do gangbusters, and and I think it didn't didn't it end up going straight to streaming. Yes, yeah, straight yeah. to Hulu. Yeah. And I think that's probably the right place for yeah. it because I think this is a genre film that 
will go down for some people. This will be a very formative movie, I think, for yeah, some people. Yeah, it was fun. I, I think, uh, unfortunately, it was cursed, like, for me personally, that I did just watch Scott Pilgrim two weeks ago. Yeah. And watching this, I was like, oh, boy. That's recency bias. Seen a lot of this. Seen a lot of this in a much better version. Yeah, and, like, there, there, isn't, a whole lot of, there isn't a whole lot of money on the screen, but yeah. what is on the screen is the is the visual effects stuff the act after production stuff yep. but i i think it's a solid film i think it's 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 got some high points to it if you're not expecting it to knock your socks off i think you're going to be pretty pleased with it well what did you end up giving miguel wants to fight i gave it three three out of five hey, there you go uh i gave this one three out of five as well this all right. is all three movies i've given three star scores to so far yeah it's 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 a very yeah, mediocre. Like, yeah, it was fine. Yeah, it was fun. Of course. It was enjoyable enough. Uh, so for our final streaming movie, I turn to you, sir. What do we have? Well, we're going to be talking about the uh, straight to streaming The Monkey King. Mm-hmm. Of all the movies I've watched this year, The Monkey King is among them. <laughs> Seriously, I'll attempt to describe the plot, but I'll oh, put good. way more effort into that than the team behind the straight to Netflix amalgamation of Pretty Colors and Sound did. Based off of the mix of Chinese Buddhism and Confucianism, The Monkey King tells the story of a monkey spirit on a quest to attain godhood by killing a set number of demons. Along the way, he'll fight an assortment of demons and discover that even small creatures can have big impacts. The intro very briefly establishes the cosmology of the world, but I was taken aback at how quickly we were thrown into the plot proper. The animation style is crisp and that's about all i can say to recommend this i feel like it would have been better suited as like an animated series of shorts but there just doesn't seem to be enough plot to string together a 90 minute movie in my opinion in a world where there's no lack of quality children's programming available there really isn't a case in my opinion to be made for the monkey king now streaming on netflix i you know i i really struggled with this one i i i famously really enjoyed nimona uh, Mm -hmm. a movie that you assigned uh, for for me, the last time I was on the show, and I was really hopeful that going into it, I would get that sort of experience out of this movie, and I just didn't. Yeah, I had really high hopes for this actually because um, I was hoping to be a really solid Netflix animated film. We've had a lot of those recently, yeah. and the director uh, directed the Box Trolls uh, years ago, which is an animated film that I absolutely fell in love with, and there's been so many really fun ones, and this one has a rich lineage in the story, and I'm not gonna pretend like I'm well-versed in this. I know there's a lot of cultural significance to this story and the journey to the West story that this came from, and I'm not well-versed in the legend, but I shouldn't have to be well-versed in the legend because it should be the movie's job to explain to me this this Chinese legend that they have. And and I'm not wrong, they just, they plop you right in the middle of it. Yeah, and I didn't feel like I got anything that I could attach to, that I cared really about, and the biggest sin for me, for a movie like this, is I felt like the animation was very ho-hum for the most part. And that that I struggled with. Outside of maybe like there was the Dragon King that showed up, I thought that, but I thought the animation was very basic, just fine. It didn't blow me away. And I've seen a lot of animated movies in the last couple of years that have blown me away. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was, I also thought that the voice work was pretty forgettable. And it's a road trip film that takes you to hell and back. And I just never engaged with it. And you know, it's a 90-minute movie. Yeah, it was real but short. To me, it felt twice that. Yeah, for it, some it reason, was I was struggling, and I was shocked when I paused at one point, and it wasn't a two-hour movie because I'm like, I swear, I've been watching this for yeah. an hour and a half already. And I, I think that there's, I think this is one of those deals where this is where a film like this can survive is on, in the streaming because I don't think it would have done. No. Very well in the cinema, no. and I think there's always going to be an audience that likes this, you know. And and there's a an audience, an Eastern audience that I think is going to really latch on to this mm-hmm. for for some of its aspects. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it is a well known tale f- for that particular culture, right? Um, but there's there's not a whole lot of backstory given, and I don't think that there's a lot of cosmology, like world building, that's that's given to somebody who might be coming at it from from uh, a Western perspective that doesn't know anything about so, it. So I mean. H- did you care about the the lead, the Monkey King? Did you care about this character? I thought he was meant to be dislikable. Right, that, that's that, the thing, that, right? That was the point. Like, yeah, he, I mean, he's an unlikable guy. The only character that I really kind of uh, cared about was Lin. Yeah. Uh, his partner uh, on this journey. I was like, okay, Lin's kind of a cool character, but the Monkey King, like, I, I Lin had an internal struggle that was going on that I kind of, okay, yep. I'm, I'm in that, for this. That was, I th- thought, the crux of the movie, but, like, it's really hard to attach yourself to a... Uh, like a, a smirky, kind of quippy, yeah. 
a hero that's the, the titular title of the movie, but he's clearly not meant to be the guy that you're rooting for. Yeah, and I struggle with that. And I felt like they needed to either up the humor or up the action or yes. up the heart of the movie. Like something. Some, it, just, it was lacking. You need to boost one of those levels up, I thought, because it all felt kind of eh, just to, sitting there. To me, it felt like drinking room temperature water. Yeah, exactly. Like it, like, it, okay, it, I mean, it gets the job done, I guess. But Yeah, it, it provides hydration, but it, it's, it, it doesn't refresh. It doesn't perk you up. It's just... It's there. I'm curious what the audience is for this, because at points I felt like this was aimed at a much younger audience than me. Yeah, I, I, and I think so too. I, th I think like the, the lack of world building that you see is, is geared towards, hey, this is plug and play. You can throw this on the TV for your kid yeah. who might be throwing a fit and you just want to throw some flashy lights on the screen and some yeah. fun sounds and it doesn't really care uh, yeah. whether the story is going to be there or not. Because there are some visuals in this that I thought were pretty crisp. I really like, it's, it's a color palette that you don't often see mm -hmm. in, in, in animated styles. And I, I, I think it's, it has some redeeming quality for that. But like I say, story-wise, just story-wise, it just wasn't there for me. Uh, what did you end up giving the Monkey King, sir? Uh, this is a little shocky, but I, I gave it 1.5. It's buddy. just enough to, to digest it. It's not enough to give it a fail. Yeah. Yeah, I, I gave it two out of five. It's below average. It's not terrible, you know, but it's just it didn't entertain me in the way that I was hoping. It if you've would. got Netflix and you happen to have a young kid that wants to watch Flight, it's you know, on. It, it's there. It's, it's a choice. <laughs> it's definitely there. You can click on it. Yep. Uh, all right, let's take a look ahead at what is coming soon. I'm looking at the weekend of September 1st. Uh, and we have a few movies. The first one is The Equalizer 3. Denzel Washington back for the third film in this franchise, to mete out some justice. This time, he is going to provide some justice to the Italian mafia. Even as more equal. He is in Italy. It just keeps getting more equal. More equal. <laughs> uh, also in theaters that weekend, we have a film called All Fun and Games, which is a horror thriller starring Asa Butterfield and Stranger Things' Natalie Dyer as a group of teens in Salem who discover a cursed knife that unleashes a demon who wants to play some deadly versions of their favorite childhood games. I can only guess that Red Rover is going to get very bloody. Yes. <laughs> and then lastly, over on Netflix, we have Love Again, a rom-com starring Priyanka Chopra as a grieving woman who sends texts to her deceased fiancé's phone number as a way to cope and what she finds on the other side might be the man who steals her heart. I can only hope for her. I'm, I'm actually disappointed because that was that was my longtime business uh, secret business idea was to have a, a, a system whereby you could text your deceased loved ones. Yeah. And, uh, there would be a and AI you'd respond. Out. Yeah, I called it Postscripts. P.S. I like that a lot. I mean, I think well, you can still do it. Well, we'll talk. This this isn't being broadcast to anybody, so uh, uh, just patent all, pending, patent pending. all rights reserved. <laughs> you, uh, you mailed a copy of that to yourself. Absolutely, right? I did. It's postmarked. We know what it is. All right. Uh, those are all the movies of September 1st, though. Is that Labor Day weekend? It yeah. might be. Wow. Um, let's see what else we have. Oh, before we go any further, let's thank our sponsor, Marcus Theaters, The Palace, here in Sun Prairie. Thank you so much for providing a cool place to watch some movies. Uh, I love it. I, you know, we, good, bad, otherwise, I love hanging out some, at the palace. We got some big stuff coming up. It's there is a here. lot, especially as we roll closer towards the Halloween season. There's a lot of good spooky, horror movies. Spooky season. In my household, uh, we're, we're devotees of the Minnesota State Fair. Once you get back from the Minnesota State Fair, it's time to put up the Halloween decorations, yeah. start watching the horror movies. Absolutely. I like that a lot. Can't, can't wait. Can't wait. Uh, next week, uh, we have films such as Gran Turismo, Retribution, Retribution, you are so not invited to my bat mitzvah. <laughs> and uh, you will be joined next week by Steve Sabaki and Jeff Robbins to talk about all that. So please tune in and uh, have some fun with them. Sir, thank you once again for joining me for this episode. Like I said, glad to be here. It's always a good time. We watched a bunch of uh, roughly mediocre, yeah, to slightly yeah. better than mediocre. I think our average today was like about a three, <laughs> yeah. two and a half, three, somewhere. Yeah, like. that's all right. Uh, so until next week, we got a bunch of fun movies going on. I'm Jameson. And I'm Michael. Thanks for watching. <laughs>